The VAC Hypothetical, as part of Midsummer 2018, is proudly brought to you by the Victorian AIDS Council. For more, visit vac.org.au or find us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to VAC's fourth hypothetical. Uh, my name's Simon Ruth. I'm the CEO of the Victorian AIDS Council. Um, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet and pay my respects to the elders of the Kulin Nation, past and present. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, we have um, Chad Hughes, the VAC president, in the room. We have Greg Carter, the former VAC president, in the room. We have many other VAC board members. We also have guests from Sydney. Our ACOM partners are here. Nick Parkhill, their CEO, Justin Coonan, uh, their president, and, and several other ACOM board members are here tonight as well. Um, welcome to everybody else. You are all very important people in our eyes. Um, this is our fourth hypothetical. As I said, in 2015, we took you to Mardi Gras. In 2016, we took you to 2022, uh, where the, we saw a collapse of the government, um, and Tim Wilson was fighting on the panel to become prime minister. Um, and in 2017, we took you to Mount Buggery, and uh, as Tennille from Joy FM um, took over the local council. Uh, as you would have noticed as you came in, tonight is being broadcast on Channel 31, um, so please be aware of that, and it's also going on Facebook Live. Please turn off your mobile phones or turn them to silent if you can. Um, we'd particularly like to thank our panellists and Adam Richards for emceeing, but particularly thank David Davis, the Shadow Minister for Equality, who has stood in uh, with 12 hours' notice, I think, to um, replace one of our panellists who couldn't be here tonight. Um, this is our premier event during midsummer, but I'd also like to point out that uh, VAC is involved in um, a number of events over midsummer. There's the Inside Out installation, which is an installation art piece at Chapel Off Chapel, which launches on the 17th of January, um, and looking at the impact that HIV has on people's lives. Uh, we're also supporting Falsettos, the musical, um, which is also playing at Chapel Off Chapel starting on the 1st of February, and the Company of Men exhibition where men explore other men in uh, visual arts um, at the Tasset Galleries in Collingwood starting on the 18th of January, so we'd encourage you to go to each of those. I'd like to now welcome Adam Richards to the stage. And... I'm going the long way. <laughs> if you've been to these events before, we now hand the script over, which Adam has never seen. Um, so it's his first time seeing it right now, despite the fact that he wrote it, and we thank him for that. <laughs> Um, so I'll hand over to Adam and he will take you through the rest of the evening. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> yes, hello, I am the allegedly fabulous Adam Richard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those between and beyond, welcome to the Victorian AIDS Council Hypothetical for 2018. This year, it's not enough to be living in the future. We're going to imagine further into the future, a world beyond this one. We're going to outer space. <laughs> Joining us on this journey are our esteemed panel of experts, sexperts and perverts. Let's meet them all, shall we? This first panellist needs no introduction, so I'm just going to point at her. <laughs> Actor, writer, comedian, the mother we secretly wish we had, but are so relieved we don't. The multi-award winning star of the upcoming comedy festival show, Disappointments with Judith Lucy, it's Denise Scott! You're down there. <laughs> Joining the panel this year is the CEO of Relationship Counselling and Education Service, LifeWorks. Please welcome Janet Jukes. Another new panellist this year is a broadcaster at Joy FM as well as a quiz and cabaret star. It's not a gay event if he's not at it. Please welcome Dina Curie. Returning after her scandalous appearance at last year's hypothetical is clinical researcher at the Alfred Hospital and the Burnett Institute, Associate Professor Edwina Wright. <laughs> Joining us from the Victorian State Government is the member for Eastern Victoria in the Legislative Council, Harriet Shing. From the other side of the party, former Minister for Health and Aging and current Shadow Minister for Equality, the Honourable David Davis. 
Another exciting new face on the panel is that of Star Lady, a trans advocate and activist who's returned to Melbourne after seven years of living in Central Australia. And finally, we have a return appearance by one of last year's most contentious panelists, writer, journalist, talking head on television <laughs> when Magda is too busy, the irrepressible David Ma. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Rainbow Haven. This is that somewhere over the rainbow. When it becomes clear that the planet Earth can no longer sustain her population, we flee to the stars. Rainbow Haven was the first of what is now a network of luxurious cities in the sky. Over the decades, as people escaped the rising oceans and withering crops, bigger and better orbiting facilities were constructed. Now, Rainbow Haven is a crumbling mess of obsolete technology, much like the NBN. <laughs> and only two kinds of people live here, the people who couldn't get out and the people no nobody else wants in their nice new outer space apartment blocks. Denise, you were one of the first people to buy rooms on Rainbow Haven. Mm -hmm. You've watched over the years of your, as your neighbours left for other enclaves and all the apartments surrounding yours were converted into transitional accommodation. Now, you know that transitional accommodation is a euphemism for social or public housing. In the future, there are huge numbers of transitional members of society because so much of the workforce has been replaced by artificial intelligence. For example, Rainbow Haven has its own onboard AI, the Dedicated Environmental Intelligent Response System by Dr. Dre, or as you know her, Deirdre. <laughs> now, Denise, Deirdre has informed you via her frequent news feed, that the section of Rainbow Haven out behind the shops, you know that corridor where the oxygen only works intermittently, mm -hmm. it's been earmarked for asylum seekers. Due to the fact that the human species has been pushed off the face of the earth like pus from a pimple, many of the other space societies believe we're on the verge of extinction. In particular, the governing body of Nova Sputnik have declared that same-sex attracted people are taking up valuable oxygen. There are rumours that terrible atrocities are being enacted upon the LGBTIQ people of Nova Sputnik. There are whispers of people being pushed out of airlocks. And even worse, one escapee claims they have been forced to listen to the music of Keith Urban. <laughs> Amnesty Intergalactic are doing their best. <laughs> their best <laughs> to rescue people from this oppressive regime. And they're hoping to house some of them in Rainbow Haven. Are these new arrivals going to face a warm welcome down at your local shops, Denise? Interesting question. <laughs> uh, I think, look, I have to say, uh, to answer this, um, I'd have to go back uh, before be coming to Rainbow Haven. All right. Yes, good. <laughs> um, I uh, lived on Earth in a place called Thornbury. Um, <laughs> some of you, especially you lot, um, <laughs> may have heard of it, let's face it. Um, so, and, um, you know, I, I lived there for 33 years when I was on Earth, and, and people would say to me, um, you know, when I first moved there, Denise, why don't you come and live in a more, you know, in Clifton Hill, where the shops are upmarket, you know, and the ladies wear sun hats. And... Um, <laughs> And I remember I would say to them, and I, 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 don't you understand, I love, I love living in Thornbury. I mean, I really love it because I get to go shopping at Northcote Plaza. <laughs> yes, um, where everyone looks just as shit out as me. <laughs> and, and that makes me feel fantastic, Adam, it really <laughs> does. And as I used to say when I lived there, you know, who, where else? Where else in the world can you roll out of bed first thing in the morning, you know, pull on your husband's old tracky dacks, your son's old Ugg boots, go shopping at Kmart, and come home feeling better about yourself? <laughs> and, and I'm happy to say that this welcoming, everyone's equal because we all look shit house kind of vibe. <laughs> has been replicated in the shopping mall at Rainbow Haven. <laughs> and in fact, only yesterday, I went there um, in T-shirt and pajama pants and felt 
utterly comfortable, well, you know, as comfortable as you can with G-cut breasts and wearing no bra. <laughs> um, so yes, yes, the shops in Rainbow Haven welcome all and everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Danette. Thank you. <laughs> Dean, you're a proud Rainbow Havener. How do you feel about this influx of migrants to what is already an overstretched station? Look, I'm not okay with it. I'm going to be really honest. Um, we already are taxed as we are. We only have so much space. And we, what are we doing just welcoming in all these people into Rainbow Haven with their dark, dreary clothing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's in the title. They've got to look nice. They've got to look bright. They've got to look fabulous. Not as fabulous as you in your grey jacket and shirt, Adam. And I'm... I, no, no, it's not okay. It's not all right. Uh, they need to upscale or we need to let them go into an airlock. Oh, controversial. <laughs> now, David Davis, these people have been uh, assessed as refugees by an NGO. How can the people of Rainbow Haven be sure that they're actually refugees and not undercover operatives for the radical regime in control of Nova Sputnik dedicated to eradicating LGBTIQ communities? Well, uh, the first thing I'd say is that, um, of course, Victoria faces the huge population uh, growth at the moment, so we're very familiar with the challenge of providing the services and the support. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I mean, I presume there's an orderly process. I presume that there's a, a refugee camp or, or some assessment mechanism uh, to um, make those decisions in an, you know, an impartial way, and you'd, you'd hope that there would be. And then the decision can be made as to who comes and, and who doesn't. Well, uh, Harriet, some of these people say they've been asked to prove their sexuality in order to justify their claim to asylum. Is this something that really should be asked of them? Well, that makes for a whole new set of YouTube applications for the future that <coughs> might prove interesting watching for those on Nova Sputnik uh, <laughs> who are probably uh, in a cloak of denial and invisibility uh, because they themselves haven't yet faced up to their true, colourful, wonderful selves. Uh, one of the things that did occur to me when I was listening to the description is uh, the focus might appropriately be given to making sure that politicians stay away from Rainbow Haven <laughs> because... <laughs> I think there is probably, inevitably, going to be a problem with too much hot air. <laughs> uh, and we all know that that's an issue which probably contributes to the very low numbers of people who tune in to listen, our, listen to our question time in Victoria's <laughs> upper house. Hello to both of you out there. It's, it's been great to have your support. And I think... <laughs> And I think, I, think that, that's uh, the it, I think that probably the other thing that was interesting that David mentioned was uh, presuming that there is an orderly process. And that probably flies absolutely against the very nature and the essence of Rainbow Haven, which sounds as though it's really thrived on, on chaos and, and a situation where stripes florals and uh, all sorts of spotty fabrics have been combined together and lived in harmony for many generations. And to undermine that with something attempting to bring order would in fact be counter, counter to the whole objective of the place. Very true. Uh... <laughs> now, Janet. Janet, how do you think it affects someone being asked to provide proof of sexuality, given that in the kind of homophobic regime they're fleeing, they would have been very skilled at hiding it. Well, I think that anyone who would ask that question didn't attend any of the, um, the Miss Wicked um, performances about 20 or 25 years ago where we all watched Bridget Hare do a very effective orgasm in, uh, on a bar stool as she told a story. So I think um, oh, my advice would be to fake it till you make it. <laughs> Now, regardless of how valid their claims to asylum are, they won't be arriving just yet. Deirdre, the all-knowing, all-seeing artificial intelligence, has consulted with the head of the body corporate, the enigmatic E, and together they've decided that these refugees are undesirable, a potential strain on the already delicate ecology of Rainbow Haven. E is insisting that all foreign woolly woofters and druggos who are most likely transporting thousands of kilos of hoochie cooch in their expansive back passages, be turned away. Yes, what a wonderful turn of phrase she has. Uh, 
<laughs> Janet, as the head of the Interstation Refugee Network, you've been alerted to Rainbow Haven's new policy of housing Nova Sputnik refugees. They're being held in a storage shed, tethered to the waste recycling facility, <laughs> with little more in the way of amenities than a port loo What kind of long-term effects could this displacement have on these people? Well, I think the first thing we'd need to look at is mental health issues. But um, I think we should probably start by saying that, you know, what have they got to complain about? I mean, really, it's better than Manus, <laughs> um, Ireland. And... <laughs> and, and I think probably there's some very good lessons that we could learn from Manus Island in, in terms of um, you know, our... Um, our policies to lock people away for many, many years. Uh, and I think, I, I mean, I think one of the cruelest crimes of what we do to refugees um, in Australia, but also around the world, is um, people obviously are refugees because they're fleeing a situation that is impossible to live in, and, and it's a life and, tr uh, life and death decision, and then we make them into perpetrators of some sort of terrible crime. Um, so, uh, I think uh, under those circumstances, anyone of us would um, suffer some pretty serious um, um, mental health issues, and that would be the first place I would uh, start in terms of trying to uh, at least manage the harm that was being caused by a single port situation. In a storage facility, possibly bought from Bunnings. Uh, <laughs> Harriet, who's going to speak up with these people when the loudest voices are usually fear mongers who seem determined to keep them in their floating shipping container? I'm looking at E. Is she here? Gee, that doesn't sound at all like any sort of contemporary experience we've had <laughs> on issues around minorities, so I would have to speculate in this regard because nothing like that's happened in the mainstream media <laughs> in the last week or so uh, in Victoria or indeed uh, from Canberra. So let me have a think about it and be grateful for the fact that we're in a hypothetical and not a real situation <laughs> here, shall we? <laughs> I, think that, um, I think that one of the things one of the things that would uh, definitely come up would be uh, the way in which the people of Rainbow Haven are prepared to think about how they would go in the Portaloo situation and the way in which people in Rainbow Haven might be prepared to allow their families and their grandchildren and their kids and their relatives to use a Portaloo next to a storage facility bought from Bunnings or whatever its future iteration might be. And we know that given the rate of growth of Chadston, for example, it will probably be the size of Earth and so probably will have come from there. <laughs> um, I think one of the things, though, to remember is, is that making sure that uh, the people of Rainbow Haven uh, don't simply accept the fact that people uh, will be having to virtually eat shit sandwich uh, but also uh, that they shouldn't swallow them as far as messaging is concerned either. So a good bit of independent media would go a long way and making sure that social media is a, is a good way to, uh, to, to have people accessing that funny little thing called democracy without this uh, hashtag fake news uh, <laughs> coming in, which again I could only speak about with speculation because that hasn't happened at all from a, from a real time perspective here in Victoria or, or nationally or indeed internationally. So, I don't know is the short answer to that one. <laughs> it's funny you should mention the media because, David Ma, you are the only person who hasn't been retrenched from the Space News Service. Which, what if we're honest... Got, David? What have you got? <laughs> <laughs> which, if we're honest, is little more than a glorified Twitter feed and a couple of long reads on a WordPress blog. You've moved to Rainbow Haven to see firsthand how a society functions when the majority of residents are gay and out of work. You've struck up a friendship with a refugee called Alex, a trans FIFO worker who spends one week a month working at the mining colony on the moon before getting on a shuttle back to Rainbow Haven. Despite having lived on Rainbow Haven for several years, Alex is afraid with this new scrutiny of refugees that next time they leave for the moon, they may not be permitted to return to their home and be shoved in that shoebox near the shit pipe with the recent arrivals from Nova Sputnik. Alex has asked for your help to become a citizen. Is it a breach of your journalistic objectivity to ob offer assistance? My journalistic objectivity has been totally destroyed today. <laughs> um, 
in a simple journey from Sydney, I arrived in Melbourne in the middle of this morning and I got safely from Tullamarine to a hotel in Collins Street without meeting a single African gang. Um, <laughs> and um, I, thought, I thought to myself, should I risk it? <laughs> should I go to lunch with my publisher in Carlton? <laughs> And I thought, yes, I'll get a taxi. Um, so I looked to the left and to the right, and as my mother would say, to the left again. Um, and I jumped into a taxi and said, Grattan Street. Um, and the man said, um, do you mean Grattan Street in South Yarra? And I said, no, I think it's in Carlton. And he drove off. And then I looked at him. He was an African. The driver of my cab was an African. And I thought, where's he going to take me? What's going to happen to me? I'm going to be taken down to the river and I'm going to be chopped into pieces and that'll be the end of me and I'll not be able to be at the hypothetical tonight. But do you know what he did? He took me to 50 Grattan Street in Carlton. <laughs> and he, he, he took my money and he gave me change and everything. Oh my God. And then I got back to my hotel later. I didn't see a single African. So I don't know where I am. <laughs> am I in Melbourne? <laughs> wow. Um, well, it's a very disappointing town, is all I can say. <laughs> now, as to my objectivity, such as it remains as a journalist, <laughs> and we're talking about poor Alex. Poor Alex. Alex, who is a fly-in, fly-out... Uh, mining worker on the moon. Trans, did you say? Trans, yes. He's a... Tra they are trans, yes. That, right, and he mines on the moon. Well, Alex has been a very naughty boy because there was a time when he could have got citizenship, but he was a bit busy partying <laughs> to put in his papers. And so my job as a journalist now is twofold. What do I do about Alex? Because we're all very fond of Alex um, and we hope the best for her. Um, <laughs> and so... I can do two things. I can have a public campaign pointing out that Alex's position is actually within the rules, or I can go to a friend of mine who is a senior official in the border force, whose name is Athens Quadrupledge, <laughs> and <laughs> see if I can get a special favour for Alex Dunn. Now, this is the problem for me as a journalist, because I think it'll work, because I know one or two things about Athens that he <laughs> wouldn't want published. And, <laughs> and I think that that's what I would do. And I would look down the track to hope that the favour Alex, that the favour Athens did for Alex wasn't going to sort of hem me in in future as an absolutely fearless reporter of reality. <laughs> um, that's the short answer. <laughs> All right, well, Denise, you've overheard David and Alex talking about Athens. The walls are very thin on Rainbow Haven. Are you going to dob them in to Deirdre, the all-knowing, all-seeing it computer? Oh, oh. No, I can't believe you're asking me that question because we all know that decent, a decent comedian would never tell a personal story about anyone, um, unless they're getting paid for it. <laughs> so, yes, if I was offered enough money... Look, the thing is, I... <laughs> because the thing is, um, with my status now, um, I'm pretty... I'd get big money. Uh, because... <laughs> no, um, because I'm famous and... Um, <laughs> I am. I, 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 I wouldn't just big note myself um, up here on Rainbow. No, but um, this is absolutely true. This is how famous I am. I'm talking worldwide, in, um, Adam. Um, it's nothing to do with the topic. Just me banging on about myself. But, <laughs> but no, I am. And uh, because I was in, um, this is a while ago, back on Earth, I was on holiday in Berlin and no word of a lie, um, I was being recognised everywhere I went there, like people going, it's her, it's her. And uh, admittedly, they did think I was Angela Merkel. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, 
which is very disappointing. I mean, she's got a tremendous intellect, but such a plain little face. Anyway, <laughs> um, so no, unless I get paid, um, I wouldn't job. But if I'm paid enough, yes. So that's so the if, way I roll, Adam. <laughs> So if Deirdre's forking up the cash, away you go. Uh, now, David Davis, how do you think all these people are slipping through the net? What more does the administration of Rainbow Haven need to do to keep undesirables out? And how do you find a balance between strict border controls and essentially turning Rainbow Haven into a prison for the people who live there already? Well, the first question is, are they truly slipping through the net? Is, the, is that really the facts? Um, and, you know, if, if there are a large number of people who, who are coming in in an uncontrolled way, well, you would need to uh, look at this closely. But it may well not be the case. It may well not be the case that there's a large number of people coming in and in which case it may not be the, the issue that people think. You just said fake words, fake news in 749 words, David. Well done, I think that's a new record. We're not in Parliament now, Harriet. Calm we're down. Always, we're always in Parliament. We're no, always in Parliament. Not all about you. We're mate. always in Parliament. <laughs> now, uh, Edwina, you're the head of the meagre medical facilities that they have here in Rainbow Haven. This is something you're required to do as part of your parole. After... <laughs> after serving a life sentence for the murder of Sharon Swallows. <laughs> Alex is one of your clients, and their latest test results are a concern. You aren't seeing any new cases of HIV because PrEP is added to the water supply, like fluoride. <laughs> but you're beginning to suspect that Alex has developed what's known in space medicine as the super clap an antibiotic resistant strain of gonorrhea. How are you going to break this news to Alex? An intergalactic strain, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that um, it's, it's actually great news because there's an opportunity to ponder on a few things. I'm assuming that uh, Alex is from Africa and she's a woman, David says, because you're friends with her. Well, she didn't start as a woman, but oh, okay. she's become a woman. She's become a woman. Or at least she is when she's on Rainbow Haven. Okay. Though there's some question about whether she's a woman when she's working on the moon. I see. Yeah. So, it's um, very complicated. So she's African and hence incredibly beautiful. And Melbourne streets are made so much more beautiful by all the African people I see walking <laughs> along. My God, they're beautiful. <laughs> we are so fortunate. And because um, she, she is from Africa, she has been blessed with uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years to enjoy the genetic shifts that have permitted people from Africa to survive. So she's actually got tremendously strong genes and adaptations and she's lost certain genes that make her vulnerable to uh, a whole number of infections. And as it happens, the super clap's not going to affect her at all, but it certainly is going to affect everyone on Nova Sputnik when, <laughs> when I suggest that she, you know, goes there and, um, and, and, and works there, as David implies, she works. So actually, I don't think she's going to have any symptoms. It's all the weak whiteies who have no genetic strength whatsoever who are going to become vulnerable to the so-called, in that truly gauche fashions that you said, super clap. I have no problems whatsoever. She's going to walk out of there smiling. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're not happy we're just murdering one person, yeah, when we infect millions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dean, you've heard about Alex's case of the super clap. Denise told you about it. Obviously, she overheard it when she was getting her bunions seen too. <laughs> These walls are very thin. Dean, do you think it's in the public interest for people to know that someone on the station has this disease? Oh, okay, I absolutely do think it's important to let them know that there is something out there going on. But why mess up a good story with all the facts? <laughs> So I think it's absolutely important that we should definitely let people know that there is a possibility something may occur and there is some things that we need to be made aware of so that we can do whatever we need to do to be able to, I, I want to say protect ourselves, but I realise I was thinking in a sexual way, 
because of protective sex, but what we're talking about, it sounds more militant when I've watched too much Star Trek and now <laughs> I've got a completely different visual going on in my head. I do think it's important to share a little bit of information to let people, because Alex is a carrier after all, and it's dangerous for the, well, dangerous is the wrong word, Wait, you're trapping me, Adam, I'm realising. <laughs> Alex is a character, carrier of this disease, and while it will not affect Alex or any of the African people in the shithole one toilet tub that exists, it will affect everyone else. So the only way we can prepare and medically get ourselves ready for what's coming is to know that something's happening. So yes, I will t tell everyone Denise told me. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna dob on the non-dobber. <laughs> yeah. Now, David Davis, we were talking earlier about the mandatory inclusion of PrEP in the recycled water supply. It's wholly subsidised by the government. Do you think that's an economically responsible healthcare scenario? Well, you'd really want to look at the public health side of it and actually see whether it's both um, efficacious and cost efficacious. That would be the sort of thing that a health minister uh, would look at. And um, in the case of PrEP, which we brought into Victoria, we, we made that decision and um, pushed forward with the trial, Edwina, and it was a great um, um, position for the, uh, the country to go forward with that. Now, on this intergalactic location, um, I'm not absolutely sure that um, you would need PrEP in the water supply. I mean, I know fluoride's very effective like that, and the evidence is clear. Um, I'm not absolutely sure that um, PrEP is. That, again, would be a matter of are looking at the facts. Well, Edwina... And I'd take advice. <laughs> Very sensible. Uh, Edwina, are there downsides to the blanket use of PrEP, or is it more effective the more people use it? Well, it, for, certainly for individuals who are taking PrEP, um, it seems that there's tremendous benefits, and really it's been the only thing we've got that's been able to sort of prospectively stop HIV infection. And as a society and as a group of people, uh, we're still waiting for the really hard evidence to come in to say that the widespread use of PrEP in a city or a state or a country is clearly linked to the decline in HIV infections. That's what we're looking for in Australia in all the PrEP rollout studies. So we're, we're yet to see its bigger impact. For an individual, I think it can have tremendously salutary benefits, psychological and not having HIV, yes, you may get in sexually transmitted infections, but we'd, I think people are beginning to deal with those in their own way. But we do have to keep an eye out for long-term use. For, so if people are going to be on it for four, five, six, seven years even, will it affect their kidneys and bones? That's, a, that's the job of the clinicians and the researchers to, to keep their eye on the ball and not let otherwise healthy, happy people uh, become unwell. So it's a balance. Now, Dean, you know the super clap is out there, obviously. Mm -hmm. The only surefire protection from it is a condom, which you haven't used in 12 years. That's accurate, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Can you possibly go face going back to using them? Can I go back to, can I go back to using condoms? <laughs> can you, all right, can you back up on one again? No. <laughs> Someone's been watching my Tumblr, I think. <laughs> I'm laughing, I don't even know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so was my question, could I can go... You, can you go back to condoms after all this time away from them? Well, I mean, yes. Uh, the only upside I'm seeing so far is the amount of fun of constantly trying to get back used to having latex on my dick again, quite <laughs> frankly. Well, no, it wouldn't be latex because the lesbians of the future have actually worked out a way to knit them. <laughs> 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 so there's that. I am, I am such a huge fan of anything made by a lesbian that I'm going to have to definitely give the lesbian knitted latex a go condom a go. <laughs> do, do, do they come in large sizes? Why? Who do you need those for? <laughs> uh, David Ma, are you prepared to publish the news about the super clap, knowing that no matter how this story is written, the blame will eventually fall on the migrant and trans communities? Well, it will at first fall on the migrant and trans communities. That's obvious because they're the people we blame for traffic jams, um, for... Uh, 
you know, for shoplifting in Chadston. Was that the name of the shopping yes, centre? Chadston. Um, all the shopping, shoplifting is done there by, um, by uh, trans and immigrants and you know, pufters. Um, <laughs> naturally, they will be blamed first. But there is an obligation to warn people because it's a danger to everybody. And that's where I see a role for the formation of what we can call the VSCC, the Victorian Superclap Council, <laughs> um, which will be formed, of course, from um, uh, distinguished citizens, um, medical authorities, um, and people with a certain flair for marching up and down principal streets of Melbourne advertising the dangers of Superclap. Um, and I think that can be done effortlessly. And then you'll have a television campaign which will involve, I think, mainly um, early morning breakfast announcers, <laughs> some of whom will, in a very moving way, admit to having Superclap. And, and there will be a new cohort of people who live with Superclap. Um, and they'll be, you know, bravely out there. Um, with, and there'll be all sorts of, you know, standing ovation will be the name of the group who uh, are the people who are willing to um, expose, the, willing to sort of say they're living with Superclap. Um, and I think a very carefully calibrated media campaign along these lines will lead to a situation where pufters and trans and Africans are blamed for Superclap for only about 10 years. And uh, then after that, a rational discussion will follow. But <laughs> 10 years, you know, it's better than AIDS, you know, 10 years, yeah. Thank you. Edwina, both Dean and David have called you to verify this outbreak. They haven't named any names. They just want to know if Superclap has invaded Rainbow Haven. Are you able to disclose the existence of the infection? Given the very small size of the community, could this somehow cause fingers to be pointed at Alex? Well, um, no one will know it's Alex because, as I said, they just carry the bug. They're going to be the survivors. Um, but if we do know that... Um, that the other people in the community who, who are, are by default white um, and hence vulnerable to actual infection. Some of those, a few of those people might be valuable in the future um, and you may want to keep them going. And um, <laughs> you can, I, I kind of like the idea of having control of who gives out the condom. So you mentioned Keith Urban listeners before, mm. they wouldn't get any. Um, <laughs> um, Amen, you know, sister. Any, only, Perhaps Greens members will get them, but no other political <laughs> party. This is just going to be so good. But I do think it's, it's, it's a chance to... Um, I do think there is an ethical um, requisite to, to, to say that there is a bug out there and that if you, if you can get your hands on some condoms, because they are essentially an archaeological, you know, sort of memory for or, those people. Or at Bunnings. I mean, think about all the Catholics. They wouldn't even know what one looked like. <laughs> so, you know, so there's so much. It's just memory. But, um, yeah, I do feel that um, it would be a reasonable thing to do. But that's where very old people are going to be so valuable. Because yes. we, can, we can go around schools and, you know, we can say, you know, in our, in our day, this is what you use, yes. this kind of thing. Yeah. And I think we'll earn sympathy for that. Yeah. Um, and there'll also, <laughs> there'll also be a sense in which we can bring wisdom from another age mm. to and safeguard the future. That's true. And also maybe people want to start having sex with us more because they know if they give us the clap, we'll die soon anyway because we're so old. And it might be a chance to get some damn good sex when you, you know... <laughs> Now, Edwina, uh, Alex is having uh, just a couple of minor complications with this super clap. If they want to get treated, they have to go on the dangerous diseases register, which is uh, something that everyone has to do. It's supposed to be a confidential database, but we all know how secure government computers are. Is Alex able to pay cash for treatment to keep off the database, or is that an in increasing impossibility? Well, I mean, look, we made it to space. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk helped us get out here. <laughs> he was a smart guy. I think we'll, I, I'm going to be confident that this, the technology will be, very, will be very robust, but there's always a human, or maybe it'll be an AI person like Deirdre that you'll have to, he, we may, he, he may in fact have to, um, you know, get Deirdre on the side. Now, I, I don't know how AI sex works. I've got no idea. 
Um, but it, I think in this sort of situation, this is exactly where, despite the wonderful science and technology of Elon and everything, people will be able to and will want to hack into those sort of databases and they will be, they will be people will be vulnerable to that. I think that's just human nature. So yeah, I'm worried about that. Now, Star Lady, you are great friends with Alex, and they've been helping you mobilise support in your campaign against the forthcoming reproduction rights vote. Nova Sputnik have managed to convince the wider space community that breeding is the number one priority of the human species, despite the fact that they have no planet for all these new babies to live on. In order to safeguard what Nova Sputnik refers to as the collective propagation capacity, a plebiscite is being held. <laughs> asking everyone to vote on the rather nebulous question, should the law be changed to prioritise reproduction? Do you think this could put a stop to people who are hoping to transition? Uh, I just want to go back to the start in Rainbow Haven, and mm. I'm just wondering how this all started. Was there, like, a state election coming up? <laughs> Very possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I think in terms of uh, what I do is if I was organising a campaign, I might actually get, uh, you know, try and get diverse representation within that campaign, including maybe trans people being able to speak for themselves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a, a really be good start. <laughs> And in terms of like we've got, we're having a bit of a refugee crisis here on Rainbow Haven, so it, so it seems I might, you know, look back at Earth and try and find some people with some lived experience of being refugees and asylum seekers and get them to speak and look at, you know, some of, some of their guidance for this as well. And maybe, you know, raise their voices so that they'd be able to, uh, you know, speak for themselves and share some of their uh, wisdom. But so a mentorship program. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want to talk to David. He's awful. Uh, Depends speak. which David you're talking about. <laughs> David Ma. It does. We are not in Parliament now, and you have no privilege. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> David Imagine Ma. Imagine the nightmare of a life where you think every moment of it is spent in Parliament. Can you imagine? <laughs> you're going to the bathroom, and you're thinking, "I'm in Parliament now." You're going, uh, um, Parliament's never uh, as exciting as the bathroom, I can assure you, David. <laughs> <laughs> wow. David what Ma. What's in your bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> now, David Ma, the plebiscite question has just asked to prioritise reproduction. There are no stated policies on how this will be enacted. Do you think that a yes vote could be used to force members of Rainbow Haven's gay population into heterosexual unions? Well, of course, we've been investigating all of the possibilities here. And um, as, a, uh, as a, a frequent correspondent for The Guardian, we would be looking at the most frightening possibilities <laughs> first, <laughs> the most intrusive, the most frightening, and the most unnatural. Um, and therefore, that would be one thing that could be happening. I mean, I can see the campaign that would need to be fought here. What do we do? Do we go to church or do we have a fuck? This is, you know... <laughs> This seems to me to be the fundamental question which would be being asked by a rational society facing a plebiscite of this kind. Do we need religious obligation or sex? And I think that that would divide the community in a way that would, in the end, I think, provide a very rational result that they would prefer to have sex. Now, whether sex has to lead to procreation is a very ancient issue, as you will understand. The Guardian would take the view that sex need not lead to procreation and that there should be freedom from procreation if you want it. <laughs> um, we would also, I think, set up some kind of scheme where people who didn't necessarily want to personally procreate could provide the materials for other people to procreate with. Um, if I could put... Did I put that nicely? I think <laughs> I did put that very nicely. Um, a range of issues like this would be presented to a rational public and I think an interesting debate would be had with a rational outcome. 
You are very optimistic and I do enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> now, David Davis, you are a supporter of the public's right to vote on this issue. It is, after all, a question about the entire human species weighed up against the special privileges of a handful of people, almost all of whom live on Rainbow Haven. You're also the sector's ambassador to Nova Sputnik, so you know the kind of obstinate governance that goes on there. Are you able to speak your mind on this issue, or do you have to toe the party line? Well, <laughs> let, let me just say, I, I think the whole idea of more uh, sex might be quite popular, picking <laughs> up David's point. So I, I'm imagining that this particular plebiscite might go forward with, you know, a, a, a real enthusiasm uh, to see um, more sex and more activity of this type. <laughs> Um, and I take up David's point too, that there, there might well be assistance to others in a range of ways. So that might be where we're heading. Um, would the ambassador from a, a distant planet uh, be able to advocate in one way or another? Well, they'd obviously have to uh, speak to home base, uh, but uh, I reckon they might be able to have some, uh, some views there. Star Lady, how do you feel about this plebiscite? Is the immediacy of our technological world seeing a trend away from representative government into direct democracy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anybody has a right to vote on how anybody else wants to, you know, wants to live and to be able to uh, express themselves, as long as it's not physically, you know, harming other people or oppressing other people's, you know, rights to be themselves. Edwina, the outcome of this plebiscite could potentially outlaw any kind of medical assistance toward transitioning, including surgery or medicine. How does your Hippocratic Oath to first do no harm work within this kind of legal framework? What do you mean by transitioning? By someone who wants to transition from one gender to another, whether it be surgically, medically. Okay, okay. And Sorry. I think what Nova Sputnik are trying to get at is by saying, oh, we're promoting procreation, but what we really want to do is stop anyone who's using their genitals for something else. Hmm. No, the Hippocratic Oath, um, it, it's an intergalactic phenomenon. It, <laughs> it's, um, it doesn't leave one, and um, there's, there's not a chance that um, there's going to be any type of um, medical censorship around trying to keep people intact or whole or going in a direction that they don't want to go, no. Excellent. Now, Star Lady, you're worried that this plebiscite is having an adverse effect on Alex. They're terrified at the implications of this public vote. The media is full of commentary about the trans community, not all of it positive, surprisingly. And the daily toll has been difficult to deal with. You suspect Alex may be self-harming. How do you provide support when you yourself are in a state of distress? I think that's where you'd need to rely upon, uh, you know, I mean, a wide community to pull in uh, our resources. And I think our community in recent times has uh, pulled together really strongly. And I hope that will transcend into the future on Rainbow Haven as well. But hopefully we'll have more services on Rainbow Haven that will be looking after that LGBTIQ uh, community there. Yes, indeed. Dean. You run the dark web information exchange and podcast known as Rainbow Tout. Okay. You know that any discussion of reproductive versus trans rights pushes your download figures through the roof. But you've heard today about Alex's precarious mental state. Can you continue your programming knowing it could be putting people's lives at risk? Oh, crap. I'm like thinking about the MBN. Can the speed really be that fast? <laughs> There's got to be a way. I, I, I would get a couple of hackers around, have a few drinks, and get them to create a side program that would weave along the dark web. So while people were saying yes for the plebiscite, it was actually flipping everything the other way <laughs> and saying no, so that no matter what happens, we get the result we need so Alex can be, and everyone, not just Alex, but everyone can get a result that makes them feel safe and all right. Oh, bless you. Now, Janet, given that there's no escape from the negative voices in the media, how do you go about providing support and counselling for an entire community that is affected by this issue? Uh, haven't we just tried to do that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, can't. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that I think that the response from the respective um, governments and responsible people was to throw a few crumbs too late. Um, with an expectation that it could all happen yesterday and uh, insufficient supports would be available. Um, having said that, though, I think that the, as, a, as a community, we're very resilient in being able to um, um, provide support and find solutions ourselves and, um, and organise for ourselves. And I think that that's probably what would happen once again. Um, uh, we fight for, we fight against a terrible process which we know will cause harm. Um, we find that we're in a terrible process that is causing harm and we support each other um, to, fi to find our way through that. We win and, uh, and then we, uh, we heal. And I think that that's, uh, I think that will be a similar process uh, on, in Rainbow Haven, unfortunately, under these circumstances. Denise, are you at all concerned that if this plebiscite is successful, you could be instructed to carry implanted embryos? <laughs> um, embryos, plural. Um, oh yeah, six Jesus, or seven. Jesus, Adam, <laughs> like I'm in my 60s. My ankles are fat, my knees are fucked. I, I... I am having enough trouble carrying my own weight, <laughs> yet alone carrying a set of quads. Um, no, no, seriously, like, I, uh, why, uh, look, all right, why should I? Why should I carry implanted embryos? I mean, yes, all right, Edwina, or I've got a uterus, <laughs> but I've also, I've also got a drinking problem high blood pressure and a dry vagina. So, so you know, look, so what I'm saying is if you want a woman who will more than likely die of a heart attack on the operating table whilst giving birth by a caesarean section to babies who will, let's face it, all have tiny heads and very, very thin top lips because they'll all have alcohol, fe what is it, fetal alcohol, alcohol syndrome? You know what I'm talking about, Edwina. Anyway, then I'm your girl. I'll do it. <laughs> now, Harriet, in the intergalactic parliament, you represent the sector of space containing Rainbow Haven. You also represent the more modern luxury stations of Star Brighton and Star Tarak. I'm so happy this is a hypothetical. <laughs> Neither of whom are particularly enamoured of their downmarket neighbours. You're one of the few vo voices in the impending propagation pre plebiscite that opposes it. How do you sit in Parliament every day when the majority of voices can advocate what you consider to be very divisive policies? Well, again, it comes back to that shit sandwich that might be presented to you that you have a choice as a parliamentarian about whether you eat or not. <laughs> and in that regard, I'd hark back to the past where we did in fact look at not a plebiscite because it wasn't, uh, but the postal survey which was conducted in the dim mists of time, uh, which involved uh, a number of areas uh, of the place now covered in water, but previously known as Australia, uh, <laughs> which, which engaged in, uh, in a postal survey to decide whether certain people of, uh, of the colony now, uh, now known as Rainbow Haven or, or the descendants might occupy, about whether in fact those rights were enough and whether in fact uh, our people of the colony of Rainbow Haven would be good enough. And that was ostensibly the question that was asked. <laughs> and, in, um, and in being uh, given that choice about whether to eat the shit sandwich or not, I think that politicians have to look at whether in fact, as artificial intelligence or not, they in fact have had a capacity chip inserted which enables them to have a little bit of integrity about uh, honouring fundamental human rights and fundamental rights around, uh, around recognition and the importance of equality. But unfortunately, 
uh, despite the fact that many people understand that it might become trendy in the future for people to support Rainbow Haven and everything that we stand for, uh, there are people who are scared. And they're very, very scared for a number of reasons that are associated with clashing fabrics and with um, finding people who are better at interior decorating and playing <laughs> Trivial Pursuit uh, than perhaps the people of, um, of Brighton and, what are they called? Trans Brighton and Galactic uh, Turak? I don't Star even know. Star Brighton and Star Turak. Right, right. So <laughs> they're those just there places, in front of you. Uh, right, Star Brighton and Star Turak. It's five Star Brighton and seven Star Turak, I think. So um, the, the, the good burgers of Rainbow Haven, I think, are entitled to have uh, a, a broader understanding given to them by politicians uh, of the parliament about the fact that when you enjoy equality, you don't tend to notice that it might be missing for others. And that's one of the really big important points uh, that Rainbow Haven would be well served to really promote as far as a good campaign is concerned. And, you know, no one bakes cupcakes like the Rainbow Haven community <laughs> with little knitted condoms on the top of them. And I'm sure that we could all get together and, uh, and promote the prep out of it all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> David Davis, given your knowledge of the politically powerful Nova Sputnik station, you're frequently called upon to allay suspicion that state-sponsored hackers have reprogrammed Deirdre's artificial intelligence and are somehow manipulating the mysterious body corporate head E. How can you plausibly give assurances that such things are impossible? Well, you can't. <laughs> I think you, you, you know, in this um, futuristic time and um, with all of the uh, IT that's uh, a part of this, all this new digital world, uh, there are many things that we've taken for granted that aren't there now and, or, you know, that won't be there in the future. And so I think um, there may be opportunities for manipulation of E and consequently a, a range of poor outcomes. Now, Dean. You've discovered some very worrying messages between E and Deirdre. It looks as though they've unilaterally decided to shut down the off-station detention centre housing the refugees and let them drift off into space in the hope that someone else picks them up and it becomes their problem. You've only seen screenshots of these conversations, which may have been faked. Do you broadcast these allegations? I think I would pass them over to David and pretend that they were facts so that... <laughs> David could put them into the world and let everyone know. At the end of the day, it, shooting them out an airlock isn't going to be helpful and have them drifting around forever. They're stuck in their little capsule anyway. So I, I would, I would definitely broadcast the facts and let people know that there might be something going on because what's a bit of fake news between friends? <laughs> David Ma, would you publish this story without verification? Oh, if it came from Dean, yes, because... <laughs> That's what I call a trustworthy source. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate. Um, I wouldn't hesitate. But, you know, I mean, why bother? I mean, in a way, if you're going to report to the people of, of Rainbow Haven that um, their unwanted refugees are going to be blasted off into space, it would make no more difference there than it does here when you report day after fucking day what's actually going on on Manus. It makes no difference politically in Australia at all. Last year, when the, when the Guardian produced those extraordinary pile of daily incident reports of what was actually happening on Nauru and on Manus, guess what the polls did the next month? They act, sympathy for the people imprisoned there dipped. So we're up against a difficult audience here, we, um, even on Rainbow Haven, which I take to be, you know, quite, quite, a, uh, quite an intelligent and quite, I mean, aging now, of course, <laughs> um, and the facilities are, as you say, run down. Um, but why bother? I mean, I think I would just report the tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, you err on the side of caution, wanting to believe the best about the body corporate overlord E, you do, however, call out E for being homophobic, transphobic, and xenophobic, challenging the mysterious bureaucrat to appear on your underground show. What would you ask if you managed to lure out this elusive figure? I couldn't hear what that last question was, Adam, sorry. <laughs> no, just the last bit. 
Uh, what would you do if you managed to lure out Eve, if you managed to get her into your studio and ask her some questions? Well, I would, I would make sure that I get some of the pe I was, people, I was going to say, stuck in Manus or stuck in the shithole tub to be there as well so we can have a bit of a confrontation with E mm. and do a bit of a Jerry Springer-style fight. Because <laughs> I think that's what everyone needs in one of these scenarios. Just a little bit more, you know, violence and throwing of the shit that they've been having in the blocked-up toilet for quite a while. Do you think that's what was missing on Channel 7 the other day? Some Sudanese and the right-wingers fighting? <laughs> <laughs> it would certainly make things interesting. <laughs> it would be terrifying. Now, Star Lady, one of E's reasons for not wanting asylum seekers on the station is drug trafficking. You know, through Alex, that even though they're not a drug mule themselves, that there are a number of people working on the moon who've taken the odd commission to bring back excess luggage on their commute home. Does this prove a right? Uh, we never know people's uh, life experiences, and although things like uh, Border Patrol, you know, show us, uh, you know, one moment in uh, time, we never know what might lead somebody to any particular moment, and therefore, why would we judge them? Very sensitive. Or involve in watching people's misery. <laughs> Channel 7, they're very busy with misery. Uh, <laughs> David Davis, how do you feel knowing that FIFO workers are transporting illegal drugs to Rainbow Haven? Well, you presumably have reasonable border controls, I would have thought, and you, you would actually sort of ask the questions and seek the declarations, and that would be part of normal movement. You've presumably got a flood of tourists coming into Haven as well, and uh, a whole range of other people uh, who, who are moving in and out of this um, sought-after location. So um, this would just be part of the normal processes. Yes, but we also think they don't have drugs in prison, but there they are. Uh, <laughs> now, Harriet, as the representative of Rainbow Haven, how do you address this issue with the concerned citizens who are also your constituents on Star Brighton and Star Turak? They don't like the drugs at all. Right, so what are the drugs exactly? Because uh, it seems to me that if Deirdre can, can 3D print a cheese pizza, then it's actually not that difficult to just <laughs> turn on your little teleporter. I mean, I've seen enough Star Trek, I mean, to, and, and, and Black Mirror and Philip K. Dick, I mean, they've all talked about this. You can basically summon, Coles Online died out in about 2048 because basically we could 3D print whatever we wanted. So, so in fact, border control, um, it, it ceased to exist because people have just teleported um, what, what it is that they need. But it comes down to what sort of drugs you're talking about. And it comes down to what it is that the people of Rainbow Haven uh, need as far as uh, medical attention and treatment is concerned and the fundamental rights to health and medical uh, care and services that uh, um, Edwina and others have talked about. But one of the things also that we've uh, suffered a very big decline on is uh, shows like uh, random breath testing, border security Australia, uh, keeping Australia safe, those sorts of uh, shows which, which showed, um, you know, people uh, from uh, my community, um, you know, basically being done for bringing in um, what they thought was okay in terms of um, a, a, a little, um, an apple they want to eat at the border control area and then being told by the guards that in fact they, they're not allowed to eat it um, and that if they do they'll be fined 250 squillion um, Somalian units, which as I understand it is yes. the currency for, for Rainbow Haven at the time. And one of the <laughs> problems is that there's a huge bin full of um, full of these half-eaten apples and, 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 you know, like weird exotic fruits and vegetables that are basically getting taken off people. And, and that undermines the multicultural elements of Rainbow Haven as much as anything else. And, and I think that's a problem. We need to be able to celebrate our diversity. And if I want to bring in a half-eaten durian, and I know they stink because it's, <laughs> it's part of my family heritage to know that you can't take them into hotels because they, they clog up the air conditioning vents and, and and there's basically a ban on them. If I want to take that in and some pickled fish, that shouldn't be taken off me simply because there's a concern at the border that in fact I might have something illegal uh, that's, that's not a part of my delicious culture. Look, I love a Chinese sausage as much as the next person, but, <laughs> but, 
you know, there are, there are certain rules. Janet, do you think the high demand for recreational drugs is indicative of some deeper problem on Rainbow Haven? Well, I think that the first question probably to ask at Border Control is, uh, what's the season? Is it Mardi Gras season? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, there's some... There's some time. There's some time. There's a time and a place for some of these um, substances, I think, and um, and so I think that that's probably a very important question at border control. In addition, you can to ban the fruit. boogie board bags maybe for a portion of the year. <laughs> yeah. um, because the main, problem with, the main problem with Rainbow Haven is that life there is so boring, um, and and you can therefore understand a tendency in the community to want. Um, recreational drugs, which will give them some relief from having to deal with Deirdre and E oh. and the dread. One Portaloo. I mean, <laughs> it's really. <laughs> and the port which I, I'm sure I've been to a party sometime in the 90s that probably only had one <laughs> Portaloo. And I'm sure that the um, available, uh, available recreational um, substances may have assisted. Uh, getting past the one portaloo. So I think that's a very important question is to ask the question of, you know, what's the purpose of these um, banned substances? What's the season and, and how do they fit culturally um, in our communities um, as we expand it? What's the rest of the question, Adam? I'm sorry. I'm oh, no, 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 that, that's perfectly <laughs> well, that's fine. It's funny you say that because David Ma, I don't know if you know this, has a vested interest in this drug trade. One of the drugs being smuggled in is moon dust. It's a byproduct of the mining trade, believe it or not. And as well as giving the transitional population something to do other than watching space Netflix, it has a remarkable effect on people with ADC, AIDS dementia complex. One of your ex-partners has been suffering the effects of ADC in recent years, and he's more lucid, his motor skills are more coordinated when he's had a hit of moon dust. His regular supply has become more costly and irregular of late, and you're wondering if you could bring yourself to ask Alex to connect you with a moon dust dealer. Even though Alex could be compromised, you never know when Deirdre is listening in. Would you dare? What you forget is that that former partner and I parted on very bad terms. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to risk my reputation, exposure perhaps in the Herald Sun, um, to bring to bring illegal substances in simply to comfort his dying days. <laughs> no, I'm not a forgetter and I'm not a forgiver. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, he can suffer. <laughs> Dean, you know about David's ex-partner and his reliance on moon dust. It's been an open secret for years. But the Space News Service seemed to get all the good scoops ahead of your Rainbow Tout network. Will you dob him into Deirdre just to eliminate the competition? Absolutely. <laughs> It'd be the easiest way to get what I want, quite frankly. <laughs> and then I can take over all of the news and just tell everyone whatever I want. Yes, it's like the Fox News. Uh, Edwina, you've seen firsthand how effective moon dust is in easing the symptoms of AIDS dementia complex. Is there any way you could circumvent the law to use it clinically? Yes, and I just wanted to make a note that um, on, Rain on Rainbow Haven, um, I would just welcome a few handy good old-fashioned drug overdoses. I would welcome that <laughs> because I'm quite convinced that um, the domestic violence that sees one woman die a week in this country wouldn't have changed. The domestic terrorism, actually, that, that kills one woman a week in this country at didn't change in Rainbow Haven. And I'm still dealing with that week in, week out. So a few kind of interesting drug overdoses would be a wonderful thing. And um, I'm sorry, that's awfully dark, but I just, <laughs> I we just have to say it. We, 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 you know, we're humans too. And uh, you also probably f have overlooked the fact that I too have dementia and a dry vagina, just for the record. D um, <laughs> Edwina is so competitive. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just not, it's not just you. We'd have to, we'd have to flip coins for that. How are you going right that. now, David? <laughs> um, anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I, I too, um, am pro, I am, I have actually been doing some um, intergalactic experiments and, and trying to get some good concentrations and purification of moon dust 
because I too have some early dementia oh. and, uh, and I, I'm going to use it myself. And I was actually going to offer to give you some, David, but to give to your friend, but that we can just bypass you and I'll be telling him that you were withholding uh, the moon dust. I will make a point of it. It's I want very to bitchy. Know. <laughs> Edwina, you've also seen firsthand the terrible side effects of moon dust on drug abusers. Mm. Liver damage, throat cancer, anxiety, psychosis. Is this drug too dangerous to be out there, no matter how beneficial it might be to a very small percentage of the population? Well, I thought that's why we left Earth behind, because they were the common features that we all ended up suffering from, <laughs> just from living on that awful planet as it declined in, all, in, the, in the terrible damage that humans did to it. So. I don't think you can tell much difference between what moon dust does and what humans are going to end up like. But <laughs> as I said, I'm working on um, purification of, of moon dust, and if given in the right doses, I think we can uh, get a, an appropriate therapeutic um, equilibrium or equipoise. So we're, it'll be fine. Excellent. <laughs> Harriet, weighing up harm versus help, would you advocate a change to the laws on moon dust? Well, harm versus help, it did start out with a funny little document that um, some people liked back in the mists of time, the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities. And that's <laughs> something which, fortunately for us on Rainbow Haven, has carried through. And the idea of proportionality and what it means to be able to um, provide help and what the, the, the balance is that is required in understanding the idea of harm. But it really does come down to the quality of the product and to the testing and to the fact that you can't simply flood the market with, uh, with a ready supply of moon dust. So um, the skills of Edwina, if you're still in fact lucid enough to be able to assist us, <laughs> would, would be a really crucial part of this. But making sure that you have a controlled series of trials um, that don't simply get undermined because there's a conspiracy between E and Deirdre to allow people who are jonesing for a little bit of moon dust to be able to hop into the survey and decide that they can get their feel of pharmaceutical grade product uh, without in fact having clear symptoms would reduce the supply for everyone else. So it's one of those things where again, um, to, to agree with David Davis for once. Now, we do agree from time to time, and we love to, you know, we love to do this. It's a sparring thing. He's like Milo, and I'm like Otis. It's great. So <laughs> one of the things that, that, that you'd have to make sure that you did, though, is have a process around this um, to make sure that when and if people need moon dust, they can have access to moon dust, provided that there's a good therapeutic uh, basis for it. And there's Safe good, moon good, dust good, is what you mean, isn't it? <laughs> See? This is why he's the Fred Astaire and I'm the Ginger Rogers, because we just <laughs> complement each other's work. Um, and, and, and it's one of those things where, again, safe, safer moon dust. <laughs> um, and making sure that we can get from 90, 90, 90, which is the objective of the moon dust process, where we have 90% of people who uh, understand their need for moon dust, 90% of the people being treated for reliance upon moon dust related issues and illnesses, uh, and 90% of people who are um, in fact um, uh, in a suppressive stage of moon dust reliance. <laughs> Moving that up to 95 would be consistent also with the United Nations Galaxy uh, commitment toward moon dust management, and that's something from a regulatory perspective that politicians would have to manage very keenly. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. David Davis, how do you feel about dangerous drugs being used clinically, given how much scope there is for these drugs to be abused? Well, again, I, I agree with Harriet. You would want a proper process around this. You actually See, would want... See, we just agreed want, again, yeah, and it's being filmed, so it's like it actually happened. Here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Look, you know, the truth of the matter is this moon dust is very potent stuff. Um, it's very powerful and has a whole series of unknown, unpredictable, untoward effects. So it's got to be handled very sensitively. Um, so you do want some controls around it. Um, but it might be that, um, that it's um, uh, subject uh, to greater controls as it comes into the the jurisdiction, if I can describe it that way, mm -hmm. um, and you might want to make sure that there are appropriate trials in place to, to harness whatever beneficial ingredient. I'm sure Edwina would be refining it and trying to find the active ingredient that could be safely used. And uh, when she's found that, 
we'll all be happy and, um, <laughs> and safe. But I'm David. Sure. But he's talking I like can... a man who never tasted moon dust. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but just I don't a minute. Know if it's here. a cheese extract, by the way. <laughs> just a minute here. I can I can bear witness to the astonishing potency of moon dust. This woman was helped down those stairs by her son before the show. She was wordless and barely mobile. <laughs> she was eased into a seat, and a mysterious but well dressed young woman appeared with, who was her moon dust attendant <laughs> and gave her just a few grains, they were just a few grains of moon dust. And within moments, she was the eloquent and spry woman you see before us now. And I worry that if this show goes much longer, <laughs> you are going to see the catatonic Edwina that I saw before. But, but you know, She's also getting very itchy. <laughs> she okay. she, she would need now, a David. team of researchers around her to quickly find <laughs> the active ingredient oh, for sure. all of us. Although all I'm, right. very, I'm very concerned about responsible use of this moon dust because it sounds terribly boring and I think that um, <laughs> the, the pooling of moon dust uh, resources and uh, consumption at appropriate times will be much more fun. <laughs> now, uh, Denise, your next door neighbour is a moon dust addict. She's also a published author, an alleged comedian, and a jewellery thief. You've been burgled several times, and you're pretty sure it was her looking for drug money. Do you agree with E that drugs are a scourge and nobody should be allowed to enter the station just in case they have drugs with them? Oh, well, firstly, I, I really take offence at uh, you calling my neighbour an alleged comedian. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, she may be a drug addict and a jewellery thief, but Judith Lucy... <laughs> uh, <laughs> she can tell a damn good joke. <laughs> um, I don't know. Look, with drugs, it, 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 it's a tricky one for me because I immediately flash back to, you know, what, like when my kids were adolescent, which is a terrifying time. I look at things from that perspective, even though it was a long time ago, you know, I spent that whole period when my kids were adolescent, you know, constantly, like, keeping an eye out for drugs because I don't know how you're meant to get through that phase without them. <laughs> poverty bag. Um, that was an old bit of shtick, I admit it, but gosh, it worked. But, but no, so really seriously, though, truthfully, these days, um, I uh, suffer from arthritis as well as, you know, everything else, drive a giant, everything. And, um, <laughs> but anyway, for the arthritis, um, I do actually, I, I, I do cry. I, I reached a point where I cry with pain. And, um, and I, one night I thought, you, you, you've got to do something about this, Denise, you, you can't go on. So I poured myself a gin and tonic, like, well, all gin. Um, <laughs> tonic's so overrated. <laughs> and um, gin and tonic. And, you know, had a still knocks and, um, <laughs> oh, well, one and a half still knocks and, um, and a couple of glasses of red wine and a couple of endone. And, <laughs> no, and let me tell you, the next morning, I felt so much worse, but, <laughs> but at least I'd tried, you know, and I'd had quite a good night. And the thing is, I don't know why, I feel like in your question, Adam, there was an assumption that, I don't, maybe it's the way I look concerned. I don't know that I'm anti-drugs. Well, let me tell you, and this is a true story, and someone in this room knows it's a true story, but um, New Year's Eve, um, I was at a party, um, 10 guests. I was the only one not offered a marijuana oil-filled capsule. <laughs> the only one. Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like to have to sit there and watch your nine besties? laughing hysterically doing nude limbo <laughs> while you're sitting in the corner with a face like a slapped ass. <laughs> it's lonely, it's lonely people. So I am all for people bringing in moon dust to Rainbow Haven as long as they give discount rates to senior citizens. <laughs> That's my point. David Marr, 
You've been doing some digging into this E character who's colluding with the computer interface Deirdre to make life difficult for so many of the residents on Rainbow Haven. You've narrowed her identity down to a short list of three people, all of whom are original settlers of the station before it was largely converted into public housing. One of the people on your short list is Edwina, and the other one is Denise. But you're not entirely sure. Would you dare ask them to their faces? Well, no. No, I would go to my third suspect, Dean, and, <laughs> and I'd ask him. I'd have the courage to ask him. I, I wouldn't ask Denise anything that could provide the opportunity for the kind of backlash that um, she provides on a professional <laughs> basis. Um, and, and, and Edwina, I worry about all the time because the clock's ticking and any moment now she's going to be unable to reply <laughs> as she sinks back into the wordless trance, which is her normal state. But why, as since when would that stop a man from frisking me or molesting me and looking for drugs? <laughs> Darling, I'm not a real man. <laughs> There's that artificial intelligence again. <laughs> Well, Denise, you're not E, obviously. Uh, not even an E cup. Uh, <laughs> she's well past that. Uh, <laughs> oh, booty bang, that's my shtick, Adam. <laughs> you do know E, though. You've been to the pokies together on occasion and even see the same podiatrist. Would you reveal her identity to stop David publishing your name in the Space News? Oh, uh, no. Oh, oh look, I... Oh. Look, I asked a question at a stand-up gig, this is a while ago, anyone got arthritis, you know, because I'm on that topic, and, um, and this guy said, oh, Peter's got arthritis uh, across the way, and I said to this chap, um, oh, you're the asshole friend who dobs in your friend who has arthritis, and this is no word of a lie, he looked at me and said, did you call me an asshole? Well, I was only joking, but yes, yes, I said I did. And he said, I could show you my asshole if you like. So strange. I know, and I said, I'm having enough trouble looking at your face. <laughs> I know. My point is, I think dobbers are assholes, so no, I would not dob in who E was, but I will say this about E, the rumours about her self-pleasuring um, whilst looking at a photo of Trump are not true. It was Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I, I, I know this, I know her quite well, and... Um... Oh, the secret oh. is out. Oh, is none other Michael than Michael Ethel Post. Chop. Oh, hello. Oh, look at you lot with all your mouths open. <laughs> Catching flies, are you? I suppose that's an old-fashioned term to you here in outer space, catching flies, because all your trousers are Velcro now. You don't have flies down there anymore, do you? <laughs> well, actually, you might. God, that's a bit woofy, isn't it? So I think about having a little shower? Hmm? <laughs> You know, just a little bit of a scrub up, it's an idea, isn't it? Good Lord, that stinks worse than an intergalactic portaloo. <laughs> uh, g'day, I've uh, just introduced myself now. My name is Ethel Chop, and I am the head of the body corporate here on Rainbow Haven. Well, I say head, I'm really the only member of the body corporate because I'm the only one that's managed to pay off her mortgage. <laughs> Even Denise, who's nearly as old as I am, uh, she still has a mortgage. That's because she's a, an artist, you know. Some poppycock waste of everyone's time. You're not getting any younger, Denise. Why don't you get a job? <laughs> uh, my granddaughter, Bethany, uh, has an arts degree and it hasn't helped her find a husband. <laughs> uh, I mean, of course, she's a, a rather plain girl. She takes after her mother, so she does have a head like a vegan curry. She doesn't really help herself either, you know, she uh, doesn't wear any makeup and she's got an awful short haircut and quite mannish, actually. A little bit like you, Janet. <laughs> Have you ever thought you might look nice in a skirt? 
Well, nice as a stretch, but you know. What about, what about a twin set? That way you could still wear one of those blazers you seem so fond of getting about in. Or you could take a leaf out of Denise's book. Or maybe dial it back a bit. You know, you don't want to look like you're giving it away and planet strumpet. You don't give anything away, do you, Harriet? No, I've heard you're tighter than a quarantine airlock. You know, I've been very disappointed with you, Harriet, as my local member. I have written you hundreds of letters. You are Harriet, aren't you? Apparently. Good, eh? <laughs> I've written you hundreds of letters about the faulty fake sunlight in my corridor, and I am yet to receive a reply. Yes, now sunlight, even the imitation sort that we have here in outer space, it is important. I mean, my neighbour's children both have rickets, which I must admit gives me no end of pleasure. <laughs> But more importantly, my snapdragons are all skew-if, as if they've got brewer's droop. Uh, my husband, Reg, used to suffer from brewer's droop. Poor fellow, he often looked like the last chook in the shop. <laughs> but that never stopped me from making things happen if I was in the mood to have a baby. I'd simply uh, fashion a launch pad, if you will, out of paddle pop sticks and plumber's tape. <laughs> And with a little encouragement, we'd eventually have a uh, liftoff. <laughs> Poor old Reg would get the odd splinter. <laughs> but <laughs> we'd simply try again the next day and the next and so on, all the way up till the day he died. And a few days after that as well. <laughs> a waste not, want not. You know, you've got to have that. Um, Harriet, now, oh, I mean, you know, you've got to make an effort in this life, don't you? Oh, who's up? Now, what am I up to here? Who was, who was I going to talk to next? I can't even see. Oh, we've got, <laughs> we've got a Dwena here, David, and then Denise, and the other David, and then... And then yes, Denise. but who's next in mine? I don't have your list. Oh, that's just great, isn't it? <laughs> Anyway, the point is, you have to make an effort in this life, and that's the problem with young people. They just give up. They, you know, you've got no bottle, you young folk. I mean, look at you. I mean, actually, I'd rather not disease you playing <laughs> havoc with my glaucoma tonight. <laughs> but, I mean, it's hard being a woman, giving birth to six or seven. Was it eight? <laughs> ungrateful children, outliving my husband by several decades, and well, spending all my pension on a lecherous podiatrist. <laughs> Speaking of my podiatrist, I might hop around this way. Why not? Um, I saw you in his uh, waiting room the other day, Denise. Yes, in your low-cut blouse, trying to bedazzle him with your bejeweled <laughs> cleavage and your fancy osteoarthritis. Just cut it out, will you? All you do is raise the poor man's blood pressure, so when it comes time for my appointment, he spends a little bit too much time north of the ankle, if you know what I mean. Still, who could blame him? I mean, you know, he's only human. <laughs> <laughs> How is your osteoarthritis? Who cares? But the thing is, my podiatrist might be a bit handy-andy, but at least he is not a criminal, unlike the murderous hussy they have at the medical centre, Edwina. <laughs> Who hurt you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I mean, you're not you? even a proper doctor, are you? You're an associate professor, whatever that is. Probably means you like to associate with underworld thugs discussing the best way to bump someone off. <laughs> Have you murdered anyone today, associate professor? What? How dare you? <laughs> Shut <yet>. up. <laughs> <laughs> now, as for you, David Davis, well... <laughs> I quite like the cut of your jib, actually. You are my kind of politician. You're probably the only one in this entire room that isn't a fruit handbag. <laughs> Good on you. But I would like your support at the next election to help people like me, people that don't want the government nosing in on our affairs. Now, I'm talking about smokers. You know what I'm saying? I cannot even enjoy a cigarette on my, or a fag indeed, on my uh, front porch without being offended by some d 
do-gooding, politically correct, mung-bean farting fool <laughs> who wants to get rid of me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the thing is, David, yes, of course you do, because you're the ex-shadow minister for health, aren't you? Oh. That's great. <laughs> so you know all about the health-giving benefits of smoking. <laughs> I bet you enjoy the odd fag, do you? Uh, on, a, on, a, on a nice porch, or perhaps uh, a veranda. Well, a drink. <laughs> yeah, a drink later. Oh, OK, yeah. sure. Uh, maybe bring around a bottle of sherry, and I might let you sit on my veranda, if you're lucky. <laughs> yes. The other thing I like about you, David, is that you put a stop to that do-gooding, bleeding-heart Janet uh, from, it, you know, giving us all of that disgusting human detritus she wants to dump in our backyard. We don't need any more foreign commie ring pirates, or whatever they're called, <laughs> in our galaxy. We've got enough whoopsies and freaks as it is without more, so I'm sorry, Janet, you're going to have to find somewhere else to dump your flesh detritus. Now, Dean, I, I believe I haven't heard your program because even though you call it a radio show, it's not actually on the wireless, is it? No, no, it's... it's no, so what is it, a popcast or something? <laughs> well, well whatever it is, it sounds like a lot of hot air, and I'm not interested. Do you have a gardening segment? <laughs> no. I can Do make you one talk for you. about the rising price of odour eaters? Sure, why not? No. Do you warn us of the uh, ooh, foreign lesbian prostitutes with their Birkenstocks full of drugs? No. Well, I, I, I tell you, I'm not interested. So just forget it. Ah, oh, you're all very disappointing. Um, oh, that's a very interesting colour here. What happened here? She just took off, did she? OK. Hello. <laughs> Never mind. I feel like doing the same. Oh, but hang on. David Ma, I've saved the best till last. I bet you wish you were back on planet Earth, don't you? Hosting a media watch and attacking all those wonderful shows by those lovely people that expose welfare cheats and backyard terrorists, especially that one that was hosted by... Um, what was his name? Oh, Mr. Andrew Bolt. Wasn't he lovely? I wonder what happened to him. <laughs> Edwina probably bumped him off. <laughs> anyway, David, I had you fooled, didn't I? You thought I was... Uh, you thought actually Edwina was he, or Denise, but you were wrong. So you might as well put that in your puffy moon dust pipe and sit on it. <laughs> actually, you'd probably enjoy that, wouldn't you, you degenerate sicko? <laughs> Anyway, as we all know, I am entitled to my opinion, and uh, as head of the body of corporate, my opinion is also your opinion. <laughs> what I say goes, it doesn't matter what you lot say here, and I say, you go. Off to the airlock with the lot of you. <laughs> Cheerio! Don't forget to write. Don't forget to have a wash, will you? <laughs> Ladies and Hasta gentlemen. Hasta la vista, deadbeats. Ethel Chop. <laughs> oh. Well, it looks like even in the future and in outer space, what happens to the human species is still decided by a bunch of baby boomers who'd rather we all suffocate so they can have a few minutes' peace on the porch. The moon dust addict living next door to Denise has still managed to evade prosecution, despite being the only suspect in a number of thefts and cravenly using her court appearances to publicise her hastily written books. Alex continues to work on the moon and no longer lives in fear of deportation after legally marrying Dean in an extravagant ceremony where one groom tried valiantly to be more radiant than a royal bride. That does sound like me. <laughs> Star Lady <laughs> celebrating the triumph of the no vote in the propagation prohibition plebiscite. Seems like people are sensible enough to keep the state out of their private parts and keep screaming babies out of confined spaces. David Ma publishes an expose on the colourful lifestyles in Rainbow Haven, which causes so much interest in the place, people start moving there deliberately instead of wishing it would float off and never be seen again. David Davis and Harriet both retired on a healthy government pension, buying apartments in that corridor behind the shops with the intermittent oxygen. They've read David's article and they know an area right for gentrification when they see it. <laughs> also, Rainbow Haven is just old enough to be retro now. 
Denise is thrilled to see gentrification in action in her neighbourhood. It's just like Thornbury all over again. <laughs> Janet has managed to commandeer the, hang the container hanging out the back of the recycling facilities. While gentrification may be threatening the affordability of housing on Rainbow Haven, the refugees have joined forces with the transitional housing tenants and renovated the storage facility. They're lashing up more containers and renovating them all under the watch of cameras from the reality television show Struggle Block. <laughs> They've become the only thing that frightens people more than refugees. They've become property developers. <laughs> Edwina continues to provide excellent health care for all of Rainbow Haven, dreaming of the day that E comes knocking at her door so she can finally administer some much needed involuntary assisted death. <laughs> thank you all so much for being here today and please thank each and every one of our panellists. <laughs> Dina Curie, David Davis, Janet Jukes, David Ma, Denise Scott, Harriet Shing, Star Lady, Edwina Wright and our special guest star, Andrea Powell as Ethel Chop. I'm the fabulous Adam Richard. Say hi to your dad for me. Bye-bye now. The VAC Hypothetical, as part of Midsummer 2018, is proudly brought to you by the Victorian AIDS Council. For more, visit vac.org.au or find us on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube.